<laughs> this is uh, sponsored by the Beltrami County Historical Society, and we're usually here once a month with something. Although I have to say we're running out of presenters, so if you have any ideas, we've kind of redone the presenters that we've had before, and I think we're at the bottom of the list, kind of. Not the bottom of the pot. I was going to say, don't you like that? <laughs> bottom of the list. <laughs> well, we just discovered these guys last month. But um, so, uh, we encourage you to go down to the History Center, which is at the end of this street right here, at the train depot. We've got a nice display and things to buy. <laughs> so, with that, I welcome the uh, archaeological trekkers. <laughs> yes. right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Let me let me tell you what we're going to do, and we'll split it between the two of us. Can you hear me okay back there? I, that's usually not a problem. <laughs> um, first, what I'm going to do is describe a little bit about what is our hobby, so you have some general context. Tom's going to talk to you. That's Tom. Uh, is going to talk to you about a group that we belong to that does what we do as a group. Thirdly then, what I'm going to talk about is a trip we made last summer, which will give you an example of a real life experience of what our hobby is about. And then Tom's going to talk to you about the equipment and the food and the clothing that we use in general, but particularly on that specific trip. And then open it up for questions. Now, I have to, particularly with Leo's introduction and being in the bottom of the list. It makes me, I have to tell you, this is a kind of a recovery talk for us. Um, five months ago, we were invited down to Illinois to the uh, North American Voyagers Council, to their annual meeting, which are people from all over the United States, and we were going to be their dinner speakers. So the, the setting was, we were going to give our talk and they, after dinner, and then they're going to take a break, get some coffee and uh, dessert, and then come back for questions. So we went through our talk, and we took a break. I go to the back of the room, and up comes this fellow, and he says, you know, uh, excuse me, Steve, Mr. Orr, um, you're not the kind of speakers that we're normally used to. I mean, we're used to more scholarly people that use PowerPoint, and you didn't do any of that. And I said, well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, I went over to this other group, and sure enough, this fellow comes up behind me, and he says, you know, you're, Tom's a decent speaker, but you're not much of a speaker. You don't tend to finish your words. You, your concepts don't kind of fit together, and you mumble. So I said, well, Thank you very much. <laughs> and I walked around, and right behind me, I'm seeking see him. He walks up and he says, you know, by the way, you don't crit say, take criticism very well. You just keep walking away. <laughs> and I'm thinking, here we've come down. I'm thinking, God, we did, you know. And uh, Barrett Allison, who had invited us to speak, kind of pulls me aside. And she says, you know, Steve, uh, don't let Robert bother you. He doesn't have a brain in his head. And he just goes around repeating what everybody else says. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was a joke. Believe it or not, I've used it before. People have come up and said, well, you're not such a bad speaker after all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got our attention now. Okay. First off, what is it that we do our hobby? You see people dress like us. And there are probably three different groups. The first one is people that go to what they call rendezvous. And what a rendezvous is, usually the time period is 1745 to the 1840s, 1850s. My analogy to that is, think of that span. That's like from World War I to today. So it's a huge time frame. And so normally, these are people that just get together, have a good time, shoot guns, and in fact, um, there was one over here, June six and seven. seven. They're a lot of fun to do. It's to me like going to Sturgis. If you own a motorcycle, you can go. 
But there's not, there are people that are real serious about history and ones that are just there more for the weekend. We do go to rendezvous, but that's not our hobby. Okay, so we'll set that aside. The second group are the ones that I would term as reenactors. You know, if you've been to Williamsburg or you've been to Grand Portage or you've been where at one of these historical sites, you'll see people dressed like this, but they, they have a persona. They try to, per, they portray a blacksmith. They portray a voyager paddler. And so if you follow my Sturgis analogy, it would be like someone saying, I want to portray a, oh, hell's angel of the 1960s. So they'd make sure they had primary documentation of their clothing and everything else, but they're reenactors. They're acting out something in the setting, okay? We don't do reenacting. <laughs> we, every once in a while we might, you know, at Grand Portage, but that's not what our hobby is. What hobby really is, is something called formally living archaeology. Do you recall when they replicated Lewis and Clark Strip and they tried to make sure all the equipment and everything was exactly the same and then they went out and did it? Okay? That's what we do. The common name for it is called historical trekking. And so what we try to do is a combination of first doing primary research, going back to the journals, trying to look at photo, uh, paintings, go to museums, so that all of our clothing, for example, the clothing I've got on, is all got primary documentation down to the thread, is linen thread, and so the cloth is material that does not have preservatives in it, so it's trying to get as close to actuality as possible. And then secondly, what we do is take and do journals, looking at trips or people where you're trying to then replicate exactly what they did. And we've got an example of last summer we did one trek, which was a little bit longer one across the northern part of Minnesota. So they'll describe that to you. So we take the diaries. <laughs> then the idea of it is, is to take the documentation in the primary documented equipment and the diaries and go do it and see what we can learn from it. Some of them are big things, some of them are little things. For example, if we were looking in, this was the year 2040, and you picked up a book and it said the man got in the diary, I got into my truck and drove it away. Now, we would all know in order for him to start that truck, he had to put his foot on the brake or the ignition wouldn't go on. But it's so common, no one ever writes it down. So the idea of it is if you've got primary documentation and then you go do it, you learn how they actually did it and what was done. An example of that, it's in transition right now, is automobiles. How many of the young, can you drive a stick shift? Raise your hand. Well, see, you can tell here. If we were down in the cities, you know, in fact, I just read last night, right before I came up, there was a fellow that got caught down there because he jumps into this car trying to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Did not know how to shift the car. Okay? Think of what it will be like 40 years from now or 50 years from now where we don't even drive automobiles. All right? But today, try to find a description of how to shift gears. Okay? It's so common, even though it's getting lost. Now, a comparable piece is, all of you have heard of flint and steel, right? How they used to start fires. Here's the flint and steel. How many of you can start a fire? Okay? You know what stick shifts are, but you don't know how to start a fire. Now, someone raised their hand. Now, here's an example. If I said to you, start a fire, and it's minus 35 versus starting a fire in flint and steel. One little example is what happens with flint and steel is you've got a piece of steel and what you're really doing, just like on a grinder, see those sparks coming off? 
What they are are little pieces of metal that the friction has made so hot that it turns red. Think what it's like, not when it's 65 or 70 in here, but when it's 35 below. That little piece cools off. So you have to start the flint and steel, even doing this, is different when it's really cold than it is when it's warm. Okay? So it's those little things that we try doing. So what we're going to talk to you about is doing historical trekking. And Tom's going to talk to you a little bit about the group then that we belong to that does that same thing. <coughs> Okay, with that idea, uh, if you're into this hobby, you've got to find a group of people that does what you like to do. And you pretty much got to find a time frame that you're interested in. So the group that we belong to is, uh, and you can see the L -E -L -S -E -C company, that's the Lock Superior Exploration Company. And what it is is a tri-state group of people that have gotten together and we picked out the year 1750s. Now, 1750s, a lot of people around here say nothing much was happening up here. It was all indigenous people living in the area, and that was it. Well, that's not true at all. In fact, my family history comes from the French side, and they were actually working in this area from 1680 to 1820. So we pick out a certain time period, 1750s, and we have to match our dress and everything to it, and then everybody comes in a different persona. I am a Frenchman. And Steve is some poor English guy. That's I am not English. <laughs> I'm Scottish. Scottish. Big <laughs> difference. <laughs> some poor rich Scottish guy going around the area. And so I'm his engagé or his, his worker. Okay. And so the group gets together and it's about 15 people all together at the moment. And we put all a little, uh, little magazine from time to time. And inside it gives uh, ideas and pictures of what we can do and the history that we can find for <coughs> documentation. And of course, like Steve said, we take that documentation and we make things, we, we put it together, and we try using it on the trail and finding out this works and that doesn't work or whatever happens that way. I've got some photographs here, which are not really period. But they'll give you an idea. I just tried picking out some photographs from some of our treks over the last few years. So you can see what it's like. They're just a hodgepodge of summer, winter, a little bit of, holy mackerel, I've never seen this. <laughs> okay. So uh, again, uh, we get together several times a year. We take what we call treks. And we'll pick a spot in the woods or on a river or on a lake, and we'll meet there. And then we'll spend a number of days or travel from spot to spot to spot. Now, truly, we live in a modern society, so our group rarely gets a chance to go beyond a week together. And so we spent the three or four days trying to learn as much as we can. Steve and I did a unique thing where we spent 24 days in the woods. And we can both tell you straight out that <coughs> 24 days with our type of equipment is totally different than two or three days. And uh, it, was, it was an education to us beyond what we expected. Let me, let me describe what we did. We went from, if you know where Rainy Lake is on the east side, so if you're not aware, it, it's north of the Minnesota, North Dakota border and then canoed across the boundary waters over to Lake Superior. Now, ironically, when you know, the Treaty of Ghent, as after the War of 1812, they had to set the, the national boundary between the United States and, at that time, you know, the uni uh, United Kingdom. What they determined was, because the fur trade was the most important industry, they literally set the boundary on the old canoe route. So if you wonder why Minnesota has such a strange looking border, because if you go east, it's a straight line, or if you go west, it's a straight line, it's because it was literally put right on the old canoe route. So what we did was go along and follow the canoe route. That, as Tom said, looks something like this. It's a little over, I think it was 38 lakes and 40 porridges. About 
320 miles of paddling and 42 miles of portaging. Now, for, I thought just assume Minnesota people would know what portaging is, but if you've got to get from a lake to a lake and there's a chunk of land in between, you carry your stuff across. What we had, since it's not modern equipment, is we carried about 320 pounds of equipment, which meant when you hit a portage and you had to carry it, we had to carry a load over, walk back, carry a load over, walk back, carry a load over, and walk back. So for every mile of portaging, we had to go five miles. Now, a little bit different, let me pause there. So before we went, going back to our hobby, instead of just going out and doing it, is in order to make it more scholarly and to learn things from it, what we did is we went back and tried to get every journal that put any reference to that canoe route. So what we were able to do is get, I'll, I'll pass this around, we ended up getting a little over 31 journals. And what I did then was we took out of those journals the direct quotes so that starting at Rainy Lake, let's say we got to Wheelbarrow Portage, anything that anybody wrote about Wheelbarrow Portage, you could read in here for <coughs> Prairie Portage, and they would tell you what the distance was, what they said they found at that specific portage. And then what we did is we kept track as we went along compared to what they said to what we found. Now interesting enough, you'll see in here a couple things. One of them is the distances, particularly on the portage, were expressed in different lengths. In other words, some of them were in leagues, some of them were in, in poses, some of them were in pipes. Pipes was the distance, particularly paddling, that someone would go until the voyagers, the paddlers said, I need a pipe. And there's a great quote that David Thompson one time, who's this uh, fantastic uh, cartographer, said, I have been trying to determine what the length of distance is for a pipe. I believe it is at the whim of my paddlers. <laughs> but what you'll see in here is the, the links, and then when you read through, if you're reading through some of the comments, you'll see that they're expressed in different lengths. So I had to develop a chart that would convert all of the distances so I could compare what they said it was going to be to what we actually found. The second you'll see in the top is, as you'd expect, the names of the lakes and the portages have changed. So we had to go back and research to make sure that the lake that is now listed as Lac LaCroix was Lac LaCroix back in the 1720s. So you'll see it listed through. And at the very front, starting in 1734 with La Verandre, were all the diaries then that we pulled out. So this was the basis then for us to have an idea of where we were going to go and what people saw back when they did the same trip that we were going to go on. Now the other part of the two things that we had to do were what was the clothing and so we could have some idea of what things would we learn from it and then secondly the food. Now one other thing I may steal a little bit of Tom Slender here is that the food that they had most of the time when they came from Grand Portage over on Black Superior and came west their food they tried to preserve as much as possible because they wanted to use the food when they got up into the Athabasca for winter. So what they did was they would have seines that they would put out, nets to catch fish, or a little bit of hunting, but you're moving so fast you really don't get a chance to hunt. But the major source was natives. Tribal people weren't dumb. They saw all these people going by, and why would you go out and get beaver when you could sell corn, canoes, etc. So in a sense, they formed 7-Elevens <laughs> all the way along the route, which meant they did not have to carry the weight. In our case, we had to carry food for 24 days. That's, if I can break, that, that's one of the problems that we have in historical trucking, because you've got to mold in 
what modern day gives you to what was happening back then. So we would have gotten food from around the country from the natives and such, but we have to carry it because of the constraints on us. The only, we had four things that we did not keep, period. Everything else was documented, primary. One was we took a first aid kit. Number two was we had all the legal things. We had to carry a life preserver. Number three was the canoe was not birch bark. When you see pictures in here, and I'll pass around, in the black book is are the photographs from our trip. We didn't. We didn't have oh, a my, lot. Of, my, this is my fault here. I have to. I have to confess up. I decided that going on this trip, the chances were we could have a pretty good spill or accident. So I borrowed my daughter's really cheap camera, and she has a little chip in there, and it's got a little lever on there, and it locks everything in. So I was limited to the number of pictures I could take, but I didn't realize that until we were on the trip. So we don't have a lot. But when you look at the canoe, it's pretty hard to tell it's not birch bark. We had a lot of people come up. In fact, we actually wanted a little antidote. One of the park rangers came up, and we were camped way up, and he said, well, I haven't seen anybody at this site for three years. And number two, he says, I've always wanted to see a birch bark canoe. <laughs> so he goes over, and we're both looking at each other, and he goes over like this, and he goes, boy, it doesn't feel like what I thought it would be. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry, it's Kevlar. <laughs> this little sideline, because of the modern constraints, we could get a birch bark canoe. But a birch bark canoe to have made right now is about $3,000 a foot. <coughs> okay, and then besides that, you have birch bark, which is very brittle at times and has to be repaired every night. That means that we would have had to take uh, tar and extra birch bark and strapping uh, uh, spruce root. And the only problem with that is the we couldn't carry the weight. And the government just doesn't let us go chopping down on trees in the boundary waters. <laughs> and there, what was the fourth thing I missed? Uh, oh, the other is we we both had giardia several times, and you know that funny thing the beavers do that makes you really sick, and so we took water purifiers. <laughs> so the four things: purifiers, life jackets, canoe, and first aid kit. People all the way along said, well, what did you do to communicate? Did you take a cell phone? And we did not. One of the things when you read through the journals, you'll see is people would run into people and say, can you give us a letter? You know, and they would go on out. So we have a friend who his hobby is making the little lead soldiers, uh, tin soldiers, for like museums and things to do battles. So he made us these medallions. And what we did then, was I'll pass it around, is that when we ran into people, we'd say, are you leaving the Boundary Waters in the next day or two? And they would say, yes. We would give them a medallion if they would send a note to our wives and say, we're OK. We're at uh, Wheelbarrow Portage, and we're doing fine. Interesting enough, a uh, little newspaper, I'm down, from, down by Nevis. Uh, the newspaper down there picked up on the story, and she actually would then put progress reports. And for all the medallions we gave out, every single person either copied it, took pictures, etc. The irony of it was, which really said, I had taken all this time, wrote out the addresses and the email addresses on parchment using a pen, you know, a um, feather, you know, a quill. Oh, no, we don't need that. We've got our cell phone. Well, it doesn't work up here. That's all right. It will when we get back. Yeah. Not a single person wanted my little piece of parchment. <laughs> okay, so I'll, Tom's going to talk a little bit about the equipment that we use and food. Okay. Uh, when we do this historical reenacting, uh, we, we have to try and keep our gear as close as possible. And... I'll just pick a couple of things here. We've got like canteens. Uh, some of the things we found out, I strongly suggest in the summertime when you're making portages and something, portages across that a canteen is carried because the extra water is needful. And you're not going to go dipping into the lake for the water because of, like Steve said, Giardia. So these are exact copies of 
canteens that were used in that time period. And they look pretty close to the ones that we use today. Uh, a good design never goes out of phase. Uh, we had to have rain gear. Now, the rain gear that we had was oiled cloth. That means that they took a cloth, like a canvas, and they put, uh, put linseed oil on it. This made it waterproof. And then we took documented shepherd's capes. And maybe you want to just say quickly about shepherd's capes. <coughs> What shepherd capes are is they're, surprise, surprise, they're not French. French would never come up with this idea. They're Scottish. <laughs> the Scottish shepherds would take old sailcloth and make something that looks like what we would say is a poncho. And, but the difference is, is that they're, you see the, the piece so it covers up in front, and they're much longer because what they would do is then peg the corners and could build a little fire and stay warm inside. So, then, here's another example though, shepherd's cape. No, linseed oil is linseed an oil. agriculture product yes. for the yes. 1750s from Black? Linseed oil is very common. Oh yeah. Here's an example though, remember I was talking about, I'm stealing Tom's thing, but living archaeology. You look at this, you can tell he doesn't win or trek much. This is a cork, okay? When cork gets wet, it soaks water in it. When it's minus 30, it has a funny thing. It freezes in and you can't get out, all right? The second thing is, what do you do when it's winter time and you're by yourself and you're out camping? We both, hot period, so I use a flintlock and you're out for 10, 12 days. What happens then is, it gets cold, the water you have freezes. So what you do is, before you go to bed, is you take boiling water, pour it in your copper, which is why you have this on the outside. You notice this is wood. Put it inside, and it's a bed warmer. <laughs> but the real issue is when you wake up in the morning and it's time to, if you've ever made water out of snow, you have to have a starter usually. So you pour a little water in there and it will make that snow melt a lot faster because the water heats up and the snow will melt. So you've got a little piece. I will tell you from experience, one of the things you do make sure is this gets in very tight. Because otherwise you wake up like I did, water's run out, your clothes and blanket are all frozen. And if you want to watch a movie, watch some guy crawling out of this little shelter that you see there with the blankets and his clothes frozen together at the bottom. And, and now you know why I don't winter camp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, along with the gear that we took, we took, of course, the cooking material. The cooking utensils were these pots. Now these are exact copies taken from museums of little copper pots. And they fit right inside one another. And one we made our meals in, and one we made our drinking water out of. And we had to do this uh, twice a day, uh, and then fill up our canteens for in the middle of the day and during the day. Now, when you do that, we cover it up with what we call monk's cloth. Monk's cloth was used back then. Funny thing about monk's cloth is it makes really good fire start. We have to char it. But in case we run out of char to make fires with, we have a ready available source right here in our bags. So we think in the emergency terms of things, too. Uh, we were surprised at how much we learned during this trek. Part of it, of course, was that they didn't take fry pans. I mean, you'll see pictures of them with fry pans, but you also have to realize that uh, Ann Hopkins has one where the guy is using a fry pan in a big canoe. And when you see that, you, you, after what we've done, the regular guys wouldn't have used it. They would have used pots. The fry pans are for the rich guys that they're taking with the the fur factors and stuff, best to make food for them that they're used to. They would never give each brigade, brigade is some people in the canoes, one of these, uh, a fry pan to use too much weight, too much to carry. Um, our gear itself, uh, we had to make up uh, things. We carried different, uh, we carried three moccasins. We carried a heavy set, a spare set, but heavy, 
and then we carried what we call these blanket mucks, and these four were for in camp because we were totally wet the entire time. And so you get done with the day, you want something dry to wear. So these were for in camp, uh, little things that we had learned doing our three day things that came in very handy for when we did our long trek. Tom says that we're wet all the time. What happens is you get up in the morning and there's dew. Now this is July and August that we were out. The very first thing you do is you load your canoe. Well, you can't load the canoe with 320 pounds on the shore. So you put the canoe in the water. One of you would wade out into the water. The other person would hand the pack and you'd load it. Okay. Now you paddle for three or four hours and you hit a portage. When you read the journals, they talk about the having to dry the goods, not because the rain was coming in or the water was splashing into the canoe, it was because they got wet going through the foliage with all the plants on the portages. Okay, so you get to where the portage is, you get out into the water, you load your stuff onto shore, you put it on, go through the portage, get all wet up to here, get to the other end of the portage, jump into the water, okay, and you do that all the time. By the time we ended our trek, okay, I'm sorry. By the time we ended up our trek, we we just quick quick idea. We had we had scheduled certain days for bad weather. We actually used more days for repair because the steam uh, a shirt like Steve's wearing started rotting on him, literally rotting, and we would have to stop and just take our gear and fix things like shirts or pants or things like that that were coming apart on us. Uh, we had. Three moccasins, I said. And these right here, these moccasins are a close copy of what the French voyageur would have wore. They're made out of cowhide. The voyageurs wore cowhide because they were thick and they were walking on these portages on rocks. Okay? So I had a close copy of this and we rotted out one completely. By the time we got done with the trek, we'd almost rotted out the other pair and we threw them away. And boy, I'll tell you, when you take these gooey, messy things off your feet at night, they stink to high heaven. <laughs> there were a couple of times we were on the portage and I'd have to go poke Steve in the back and say, tonight we've got to take a bath. <laughs> but actually, the clothes, and there's an example. What, all of our thread is linen thread. So it not, does not have preservatives in it. So within the first week, the thread started rotting. Within the first two weeks, all the clothing started rotting. I had three pairs of wool socks. By the time I got done, two of the pairs did not have any bottoms. Right? Again, just because. And in fact, I've seen in museums, did not know why really, where you'll see where the tops are different than the bottoms. Because what they would do, not dumb, the top part was still good. They would just sew, you know, knit bottoms and sew them on together. Well, we carried three shirts. We carried a light shirt, a medium shirt, and a heavy wool shirt. And by changing combinations thereof, that's what we used for our entire trip because we can't carry the weight. We've got to keep it down to a minimum. So it was kind of a trial and error. What could we take? What's going to keep us safe and warm at night? Um, we had our food pack. Uh, this is a canvas pack and it folds up the food inside, keep it as dry as possible, and this we would have to hang in the trees every night because of the bear and things like that. And Steve made a good point. Back in the old days, they wanted the bears to come in because they'd shoot them and eat them. <laughs> you know, on our case, we were sitting there waiting every night for this little tap on the tent. Um, we used uh, packs, and the packs were basically the exact same design as Duluth packs. And they use tump lines. A tump line is a piece of rope with a piece right here, and it goes across the pack and then across your forehead like this, and then you march across the portage. You've probably seen pictures of voyagers doing that. Yeah. Well, that's exactly how we did it when we went across the portages. But again, when people think about carrying, using a tump line, you think that people did it because of the weight because you can carry a lot more weight, interesting enough, because it's more uh, fits onto your backbone. One of the things that makes a huge difference, though, is not just 
the weight carrying, but when you've got that top line on and you have a regular pack with no top line, <coughs> it tends to shift. Okay, it'll move back and forth. Because nowadays they have belts that hold it here and they have cross pieces that hold it on, on the front. But in the old days when you just had the straps, that weight you're carrying 45 pounds on your back and it's shifting along. If you see some of those pictures, you'll see that you're going through a swamp that is you know, up to your knees and you're on a little board sometimes like this, sometimes not. So if you fall, you're, it's really difficult to get back up. Tell them about that. Yeah. We both fell once. Once, I'm going across this board, it's all slimy. When I say board, what it is is a log that's cut in half. And I go down, I couldn't get back up. I was down in the swamp like this, and Tom says, are you okay? And I said, yes, but I need some help getting back up. <clears throat> Mr. UPS man retired. <laughs> We're on one of these god-awful portages. It's a mile and a half long. You go up this huge hill, literally like this, and then you get to the top of it, and you're going through a swamp, and it was outside of the boundary waters on the east end, so you had all these trees. So think of taking a 63-pound canoe, put it on your back, and climb into the back of a pickup truck. Okay, or a 40-pound pack and climb into the back of a pickup truck. It's about that high. So we're climbing all over. We're going through this swamp. He goes running by me. I hear this, kasplosh! <laughs> you need any help? No! He was gone. Mr. UPS man, I have not fallen on the whole trip. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so well, we fell twice. Luckily for me, I fell forward instead of backwards, so I could use my hands to push myself up. That was the difference between that. So, uh, you know, it's kind of situational, too. Um, I think I should probably state that when we went, we did historical, so we used one blanket. We used just canvas for our tents that we made at night. Those are actually two pieces of canvas put together. Two one pieces of oil cloth. cloth. Two pieces of oil cloth, canvas oil cloth. And uh, that's all we took. There were no bug nets, you know, to over the front of it and the whole bit. You know, at night we would sleep and you would hear the power lines going over the top of you every night. And there were no power lines. <laughs> so, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Interesting enough, if you look through the documentation, there was actually people used mosquito netting. And in fact, uh, you can find references to mosquito nets as early as the 1720s, 1730s. There's a great diary by a fellow, by a young fellow by the name of David Ballantyne, who's probably about 18 years old. He was up at Hudson Bay. He had gone there when he was 16, and he talks about sitting inside and opening the doors, the windows, letting all the mosquitoes come in towards the candles, and then taking their pistols without shot inside and blowing away the mosquitoes. <laughs> but he's coming down from, Win uh, from Hudson Bay to Winnipeg, and in the diary he writes, and everybody says this, mosquitoes were troublesome. Mosquitoes were very troublesome. Uh, there was a point where out at Pemnana, they lost so much blood from the mosquitoes, they had to walk to keep the horses moving. So David Ballantyne writes the first night he's out, mosquitoes were extremely troublesome. The next night, he takes stakes, puts them in a circle, throws what was basically cheesecloth across it, crawls inside, makes this green fire out of leaves, etc., and smokes it, crawls inside, and he writes in his diary, the paddlers think I am effeminate because I am sleeping within my mosquito tent. I do not care. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty much the gear. Uh, we try to keep the food as, as uh, historically accurate as possible. When you think of food, what do you think of? Any ideas? Throw me out of some food. Pea soup. Oh, I'm sorry, say again? Pea soup. Pea soup? Well, yeah, we did have some pea soup. Uh, so that was historically accurate. Um, and the pemmican we had, but the pemmican we had a problem with. It only lasts for so long, and then it starts going rancid. The other real problem with pemmican is the weight. You know, if you think, you read the journals and they talk about trying to plan for a pound of pemmican per person per day. Now realize, when you one of the research things I did was there was a fellow, a young fellow working on his PhD looking at how many calories do you burn 
And so he used modern equipment, went across and, and measured it. You burn somewhere between 500 and 600 calories per person an hour. Okay? When you're portaging, you burn somewhere between seven and 800 calories per person per hour. Okay, so when you look at pemmican, and you say, how much pemmican, a pound of pemmican, how many calories are in it, versus what else you can take that's dried, the pemmican doesn't give you, I mean, it gives you fantastic calories to begin with, but you can't carry the weight. If we were going to have taken a pound of pemmican per person per day, okay, that's two, times 24 days. You see the problem already? So we had to use pemmican for just the same. Same thing with cheese. Cheese, cheese is great, but again, it weighs. The lifesaver for us is oatmeal. Oatmeal was used then, it was quite, uh, quite light, quite easy to handle, and uh, we used it quite a bit. Um, we had coffee, coffee was used back then, and we had tea. Uh, we had uh, these little pemmican bars for lunches and stuff. We, we didn't start a fire at lunches, there was no time to do that. Uh, we haven't mentioned that when we started the trip, much like the historical stuff where they would go with their furs and stuff or their, their trade goods and have to be from here to there at a certain time, we were planning on being from Crane Lake to Grand Portage for the rendezvous. So we had a time limit that we had to meet. So we had to push too. So we, we didn't start fires in the afternoon. We started them in the morning and the evening and we set up a pretty good routine. One of the things that happened is we found that different, like when you're just going out for four or five days, we didn't stop. In other words, you read through the journals and they very rarely took breaks except for pipes when they were paddling. So you would just keep going. And in fact, we ran, you know, you'd run into groups. There were this group of women, three canoes, who by far, there must have been, oh, in their 18 to 22, 23 range, there were Canadians out of a camp up in Canada. And we went back and forth with them for almost three days. And by far, they were the best paddlers we ran into the whole time. So we could out paddle them because we wouldn't stop, okay? <laughs> when we hit the portages, they only had to go across once. They would have the canoe out and they'd be gone. And the funny part, we, got, we go through, we're going into Gunflint on, um, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of Magnetic Lake. And we'd hit this god-awful portage. They had gone ahead of us. They were gone. We come paddling out, and we look over about a half a mile on this island, and there are these three canoes with women there. This one goes, ah, oh, we're getting ahead of you. So we go, they jump in their canoes, out they paddle, and it's not the same three set of canoes. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, oh, God, we're, we apologize. They said, oh, no, that's group number 18. They just went through about 35 minutes ago, and they said there were these two old guys behind them, dressed funny, and they didn't want them to catch up. <laughs> now, I don't mind the funny part, but the old part really hurt. <laughs> it did. It did. It just stopped us right in our tracks one. Um, just to kind of finish off the food part, you know, we had beans. We had... Uh, soup with uh, beans and peas. Uh, we had chocolate. Chocolate was proper back then. It was, it was sold. One of the things that was a lifesaver for us was hardtack. And hardtack is nothing more than uh, unleavened bread made really hard. Uh, you know, you hear about it in the Civil War, you know, the hardtack, you know, it's the same stuff. The only problem we found out is by the time we'd get done toward the end of our trek, most of our hardtack had a green color. <laughs> so the, the moisture content was a real problem, a very big problem. Okay. Um, we'll just take about three, four minutes and we'll ask for questions. But let me, let me just, there's a couple things that we, you know, uh, I'm out in the woods probably in this somewhere between 50 to 100 nights a year. Okay, so I'm, I do it a lot. Tom's, because it, before he retired, was working, he couldn't be out that much, but was clearly out probably 30 to 40 nights. I had never had a chance to be gone. The longest I'd ever gone was up on rainy for two and a half weeks by myself. I'd never gone and tried to travel this distance. So 
you know, you think you've learned just about everything, and then you find out there's some things that just kind of go, oh my goodness. One of the things was on the big scale of things. One of the things that you start appreciating is how much two things govern our modern lives. Number one is light. Mm -hmm. okay. Both of us, for all of our trekking, even in the wintertime, I've got a little piece of candle that's about this big, and it's probably 10 years old. Okay. I never light a candle. You get up, it's wintertime, you're going deer hunting as an example. What's the first thing you do? Well, you go like this. Why light a candle to start a fire? So you start your fire, you eat your meal, and you go out. You come back in during the day, make your big fire for your big meal because you can see, and then when you come back in the night, you build a little fire, and you go to bed. Someone asked us on our trip, you must have seen some really fantastic sunsets. You know how many sunsets we saw? One, <laughs> the very last day. Okay. You put in, you know, how many sunrises did we see? Every single one. Because you're on the water really early to get the distance, and you paddle for 12 hours. Paddle for 12 hours, the mosquitoes come out at night, and you're in bed, you know. So, light governs. If you want an example of that, there's a painting by the name of George Romney. What do you think in the 18th century, 1740s, 1750s, 1760s, was the most popular child's pet? Flying squirrels. Okay? Flying squirrels are the only, one of the few animals you can take as an adult and domesticate. But if you're a kid, I turkey hunt, and we've got some friends back in West Virginia who are, I mean, if you saw Deliverance, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, that dates a generation, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, these people are, you know, they came up deer hunting and had never been out of the state of West Virginia, had never had a McDonald's, had never had a Burger King, sold some puppies, a horse, and, and, and some chicken money, had enough money to come up here deer hunting and have enough money to eat at McDonald's coming up and Burger King going back. Oh my God. This, this is not an exaggeration. exaggeration. There's no exaggeration. It never seen. Now, what did they have as kids? Flying squirrels. Why? Because it's dark at night at five o'clock. What better than to have a little pet that does not eat much, wakes up when it gets dark so you can play with it. So flying squirrels were, so light is one thing. The other is time. Within, oh, no more than four or five days, you lose the, we'd say, what time do you think it is? No idea, you know? And without my diary, we wouldn't have known what the day was. When I go out by myself, I take a stick, and every morning I have to do something, particularly at my age. So, minute I go out and take a piss, I take a stick and make a mark in it, okay? Because I know it's something I have to do, and I know I can keep track of the days. You lose track of the days. We got to Grand Portage, and really late, which is on the Lake Superior camp that night, got up in the morning, we're walking around, and asked somebody what the time was. We were three hours off. Now you think, how in the world could you be three hours off in the morning? Uh, you, you heard me, you heard him say that I used to work for UTS. I could just about tell you the exact minute of the day on any given day because I had to be at this place, this place, this place, this place by a certain time. Mm -hmm. I lost it completely. Mm -hmm. Just for the heck of it sometime, take your watch off, close up your, your phone so you can't see what time it is, and just go for a day. The other is, Go into the house at night and don't turn on a light. And you get a sense of when people talk about having to know where things are in their packs <coughs> and what they do, of doing things, what it's like to be in the dark. Those two things, I think, struck us the most of, of what we did. The other is it's a great way to lose weight. He lost 15 pounds. We were eating someplace around six to 7,000 calories a day. 
and losing weight. And I lost 10 pounds and he lost 15. So next, we're not doing it this summer, but next summer we're going to go from Lake Superior in the other direction. <laughs> That's the one other thing I would say is, is that we, as you may know, that the height of land or the water, if you go about to, from the North Dakota border across Minnesota, about two thirds, you hit a portage called height of land. At that point in time, all the water runs towards Lake Superior going east. All the water at that point going west <coughs> goes into Winnipeg and up to Hudson Bay. So about two thirds of the distance we paddled was upstream and then downstream. So part of what we want to do is go back the other direction with a camera that works this time <coughs> and just be able to compare what was going on. Surprising enough, when you compare the diaries to where the trails are today, they're almost exactly the same. Uh, that, that includes the looks and the feel of each trail. You can tell that because, for example, they'll refer to a rock called Pigeon Rock that looks like a pigeon on the left-hand side of the trail going from east to west. Since we were going the other direction, you could look at the portage and there was Pigeon Rock, you know, within it. I am convinced, though, that when you, which I meant to do this winter and I didn't do, and we took the distances, modern compared to what they did. Some of them are, so there's some substantial variation. And I think what happened was, you, when you look at the portages, they're going through, you'll see one of the pictures in there where you're going through a rock cleft. Think of taking a large, cargo canoe through that cleft, it wouldn't fit. So they had to have, you know, and you can look over and see where there would, might have been another spot where they might have had a different trail. And I want to match up the widths of the portages we did to seeing if those are the ones that disagreed with the distances. Now, it's not something everybody's going to get really excited about. It's like, you know, oh yeah, <laughs> but it's the, the little things. Let me stop and ask for questions. Okay, just one, one quick and then question. I just want to point out the last thing that we learned too was how functional these clothes are. For being out in the wilderness, these are probably the most functional clothes I've ever had. You see how blousy these are? It keeps the mosquitoes up. <coughs> I don't use bug spray. Anyway, so anyway, mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, just an example. If you look at both of our sleeves, you notice that they're made much longer. And the reason for it is, what do kids aren't dumb? How many kids do you see with, you know, the, well, not only that, but in the wintertime up here, what do you do? Exactly. Okay, you put these in mittens and it stays warm. Time to pick up a piece of pot, you know, hot kettle off the fire. So, I mean, there are a lot of little things that, you know, the length of the, the cloth, et cetera. Let me stop there. We could go for on forever. Yeah. Questions, yes, please. Um, well, it's three things. Um, the oatmeal that you had, was that stone ground? Yes. Is that what it was called at that time? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, they didn't. It depended on, it's like cloth. Cloth, you didn't refer to it as cotton. You referred to where it came from. So, like, one of the... the one of the cloths that you can go over to Joanne Fabrics and find that this period is Onnensburg. Yeah, you can still get that. Exactly. Or Monk's cloth that yeah, we use. Yeah, you can still use. get that too. You can still get that. Those are two that have carried forward into the modern time. So instead of seeing that where they would say it's stone ground or, you know, cut oats or whatever, it usually was referred to from such and such a place. Okay. And then the canoes you used, uh, how did they compare with today's um, fiberglass? And how long were they on, on average? In our case, we use Kevlar, which is a, little, which is a, a form of fiberglass. It's a oh. little bit lighter. Our canoe, with it's got wooden gunnels and everything yep. else yep. And with that. Oh, I worked in a canoe factory, so. Oh, okay, so it, it, um, they weigh, like the, that canoe that you see in the pictures weighs about 62 pounds. Okay, because we did a lot of canoeing and we had a 17-foot fiberglass. Um, and then I'm kind of surprised in a way that you kind of talked to people who suffered from mosquitoes. 
I came from a farm and my dad made smudges all the time for the cows. Yeah, what the reason didn't for- Didn't you use a lot of smudges? No, they didn't because, simply because you didn't have, it's a question of time and moving. If you were sitting in a single spot at I mean, night- for, Like nighttime. For there are time places, there was a, a place called The Meadows, which is about a day and a half in from Lake Superior, and they would party once they got up to the Grand Portage and stop. And they talk about uh, burning the grass in order to get the to get as much. The trouble is, is that they, when you get up into the boundary waters of that area, you literally have millions of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's it's. And then the and minute the, the minute you start moving during the daytime, you're going through brush and everything else that you're doing. Now, on our particular track this year, we didn't. You know, mosquitoes were not that bad. But you've got deer flies, uh, black, flies. black flies. There was a fly that looks much like a uh, that, modern hell's fly, <laughs> except that it lands on you and emits a uh, very uh, an acid that melts your skin. And if you notice on my, my leggings, I've got these holes. I have none. Yeah, I, not. <laughs> I had lemon and when I took these off at night, you could see the spaces where the flies had crawled through a hole oh and emitted that acid through my wool socks. So I had burns going down evenly spaced all the way along. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, I would take <clears throat> mosquitoes over deer flies and those flies any day. <laughs> yeah, and there's a case of personic. As a, as a Scotsman, he's wearing the type of leggings that they would have used. I'm used, wearing leggings. All one wrong. Two yeah, he's seconds. willing to do this, okay? There's a great reference in there by one Scotsman. He says, I'm sitting at the head of the portage drinking my tea. My paddlers are carrying our baggage over. I hope they finish before I finish. <laughs> so I had my little cup and I kept waiting for him to haul stuff, but it never worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, I am not sure exactly what pemmican is, and I don't know. Do you guys know what it is, pemmican? How many guys know what pemmican is? I thought. Okay, so you take a, you take a, you take all the fat from an animal you kill, and you melt it down, and you put it in a pan, 50 percent, and then you take a bunch of meat and you grind it up into a powder and mix it with it. Take you know what jerky is, right? Yeah. Okay, so you make jerky. Period jerky, you know where you buy it in the store now. You can chew on it; it's real kind of soft. Period jerky was very salty and, and extremely dry. So you could take and pound it into a powder. So you would take so you mix that in and, and you can mix berries in with it if you want, dry berries we're talking about. And it lasts pretty good. And if you want to be really authentic, you have to throw in some really dried leaves and twigs with it too. <laughs> and when we had pemmican, we took probably 20 pounds of no 15, 15 pounds of pounds, yeah. pemmican. One of the things, two things you learn is, is pemmican has no taste to it really. It's kind of bland. But it is great filler in a soup. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, you know, and it always worked out that way, we did everything 50-50, except that I noticed that the night, he did all the cooking, I'm not much of a cook. And the nights that, that we had pemmican was my night to clean the pot. When you look at these pots, they're ten line, ten line, so you can't use sand or anything to grind stuff out of them because you take the tin off and copper's poison. So you have to be very careful about, okay, think of this, well, there's probably, see that brown rim in there? That's pemmican. <laughs> and it's been in there a long time. <laughs> it, it's horrible to get out of your pots. 